I feel full. I feel connected and directed. I feel the presence of a spirit that I have labeled God using me to help some of the people who've lost their way. Somebody said, if you were broke, what would you do immediately? Good question. If you were broke, what would you do immediately? Uh, number one, I would really check to see if I was actually broke. That would be number one. Because oftentimes what we call broke is not actually broke. What we call broke is like, I don't have what my neighbor has. I don't have what my friends have. I don't have what the, what the guys on Instagram have and therefore I'm broke. A lot of times people are striving to get to this space to only find out that when they get to that space, they actually lose, sometimes, the ability to do what they were doing when they were so-called broke. So for instance, if you can still travel and, and have fun with your friends and play video games and do stuff that you love right now, and yet you're trying to grow this big business so that you can travel, play video games, and do stuff with your friends that you love, then you actually have the thing you wanted, you just aren't paying attention to what you currently have. Said differently, you can't have what you want, but you may experience what you have. What are you having in this moment? Now secondly, if I was actually financially in a position where I needed more money immediately, I would search my consciousness and ask myself, what can I do right now that is in alignment with the truth of my being that will produce money and serve humanity? Boom! That! And then whatever answer comes back, then I would, let's say five answers come back. I'd, I'd go through process of elimination. What, which one of these out of the five, which one of these will produce money the fastest, but is still in alignment and create space and room for all the other things I desire? That's what I would do. Okay. Somebody said, how can I get my ex to leave? We have been living together, but broken up for four months now. He refuses to leave. We can't have a conversation without fighting. Yes. Okay. So one, let me just acknowledge that um, relationships can be very challenging. And um, I'm so sorry that you're experiencing this and congratulations because um, everything that occurs in our lives is an opportunity for us to expand into love or contract into fear. And oftentimes, when uh, something isn't working the way we want it to, we contract into fear. And uh, what you resist persists. But, and, what you truly look at disappears. So I would first ask myself, what am I in resistance to really? Right? Number two, I'd ask myself, have I actually made this clear? Number three, if this is a boundary, Am I willing to defend this boundary? Because people treat us how we treat ourselves. And a lot of times, uh, the betrayal that we point over there and say, hey, you betrayed me, is the same betrayal we had for ourselves weeks, months, years before. So, um, you told me two things. One, you want him to leave. Two, you're saying that you guys fight a lot, which means what I hear you saying is that you, the fighting is the thing that is, sucks and you're trying to avoid fighting. Um, so one, practice um, relinquishing the part of you. And I understand from a nervous system perspective that fighting um, is scary. It's a lot. Um, but what if you stop resisting that part? Now, the question is, why don't you leave? Have you called the police? Have you asked him? Have you given him a date, a time? Have you shared that if you aren't out on this day, I will be out on this day? These are all things that you get to work through and look at for yourself. Now, I, I know there's a lot more details to it, and my heart is with you in the sense that I know uh, relationships can just be really tough. Someone said, how do you help someone stay accountable to what they asked you to help them with? How soon do you give up on coaching them? Ah, this is really beautiful. Consequences. You help someone stay accountable by consequences. So for instance, with some of my clients, 
I'll say, hey, I need you to do X, Y, and Z by the time we do our next call. If those things are not done, we are not doing our next call. If those things aren't done, then you've just wasted your money because I'm out. Let me know when they're done. When they're done, I'll be there in a second. If you have boundaries that you are not willing to defend, they aren't actually boundaries. Your work is to stand by your work. Stand by what you say. Because if we don't, if we don't believe you, and if you don't believe you, then there's no, there's no reason why I'm going to follow through. Hope that helps. How do you stop loving and hurting over someone that isn't choosing you? There we go. This is a tough one. You don't stop loving. Love is beyond uh, boyfriend and girlfriend. Out of 8 billion people, your soul and this person's soul chose each other. So you don't stop loving. Now the second part of your question is, is uh, and hurting over someone that isn't choosing you. The hurting part is by allowing yourself to really sit with and feel the sadness, the grief, the, 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 the understanding that the dreams and the things you had set up for this relationship aren't going to happen, at least not in the way you thought they were. A lot of times we hurt because we're in resistance. We hurt because we think we know better than God. But what if? What if there is a being one month from now, one year from now, that is actually your soulmate? And the one that's leaving you now is doing you a favor, but you haven't been able to see it because you're so caught up in what you think is supposed to happen. I have things happen all the time. And you know what I say? Spirit, do your thing. God, I see you moving. I know you're working on my behalf ahead of me. My, my steps are ordered. You've already done the thing. I asked you for something and I know you're delivering even if it's wrapped in strange wrapping paper. So again, we have to have faith. Whatever is occurring is for our highest good. And I'll help you understand that even deeper by asking you the question, have you ever been through a breakup? Have you ever thought to yourself, oh my God, I, I need him, I need him, I need him. And then six months later, you found someone else. And then that breakup, oh my God, I need him, I need him, I need him. And then two years later, another one. So there's a pattern here. One of the patterns is the universe will never forsake you. That your person will always find you. The other one is that you keep putting yourself in these codependent scenarios where you think you need this being. The game is to notice them as a cherry on top, but not the whole cake. You're making them the whole cake. And that's why, probably partially why, they don't want to be around. Because that's a lot to hold for one human. So, honor the love. I love all of my exes. And I'm in love with my wife. And if my wife and I were to ever break up or transition to something else, I'd still love her. And my personality would be mad and sad and all the things. And sovereign being. Taken care of, guided, guarded, and protected. As long as there's breath in this body, which is a confirmation number. As long as that, 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 that heart is still beating, there is a mission. There is a, a divine curriculum for me to fulfill. And if that is with this person or this person or this person, I trust. I know that's a tough pill to swallow when we've been taught this Disney style of being together. But you don't own them. And they don't own you. Sometimes we meet people and we're supposed to dance with them for three songs. And by the fourth song, we're off into another adventure. But a lot of times we get stuck and we want to play the song again. We want to play the song again. We want to play the song. Go back. I want to rewind. I want to go back to when it felt like this. I want to go back. I want to go back. I want to go back. There's another song. And in between the songs is a pause, a space to rest, a space to germinate, a space to breathe, a space to go into a divine sacred union with oneself before the next song plays and the next dance partner makes them their way over to you. But when we get caught trying to 
replay. And we get caught up in the weapon of mass distraction trying to, to, to abdicate our power to this one being, this being. This is my God. That's what you're saying. You're making that person your God. So all of this is an invitation into true self-love. What's your view on dark comedy slash dark humor? Uh, I think it works for who it works for. Uh, and dark is uh, relative. Some people just, a curse word is dark to them. Right? So I don't know what you mean by that. How can I manage and overcome emotions from chronic illness? Ooh, okay. So again, managing and overcoming, right? Just notice the language, manage and overcome. Both of these linguistically um, aren't necessarily the highest choice. So uh, the first one, and, and they, they cancel each other out in some way. So I want you to notice the language. A lot of times we do this. We'll, we'll use one word and then we'll use another word that cancels the other one out. And all of that, underneath all of that, is our subconscious thoughts about the thing. So number one, I ask you to notice what your subconscious, and I know it's hard because it's subconscious, but what do you actually believe about the chronic illness? Do you believe that it's a punishment? Do you believe it's a life sentence? I know you can tell people, I'm going to overcome this. But what's under it? When it's just you in your bedroom alone, what do you believe about the chronic illness? Because if you believe that it's a life sentence, that it's a punishment for something you did in the past or whatever the case may be, then that thing is never going anywhere. Number two, I have a belief that unprocessed trauma in the body is a part, a part of why some people experience certain illnesses. Now, to me, if I'm having anything occur in my body, it's at, at the very least worth it for me to lift up some of those stones. My son and I were in the creek back here in the backyard yesterday, um, and he was lifting up stones looking for snakes. And I think that there's a perfect analogy or metaphor for all of us. What stones have you lifted up? And one of the most important ones is what trauma is still living in my body? What shame, what toxic shame am I still carrying around day to day? Whose perceptions and fear and lack and limitation am I carrying around? Oh, that's my mom's. Oh, that's my dad's. That's his dad's and his dad's. Oh, that's society's. Oh, that's black people. Oh, that's Asians. Oh, that's this. Oh, that's women. Women are only supposed to. Whose stuff are you carrying? Because it's not the load that breaks us down, but the way we carry the load. It's not the load, but it's how we carry it. And when you begin to work on relinquishing, dropping it like it's hot. You ever played that game Hot Potato as a child where you just, nope, nope, not mine. A part of dropping it is disassociating, pulling back. That's not me. That's not who I am. That's who I became. Mm, I let that one land. That's not who I am. That's who I became. This was a strategy. Some people get sick and hurt and, and mess things up as children to get more attention. And then all of a sudden, that seven, eight, nine, ten year old is now a 30 year old and they're still messing things up, getting hurt to get attention. And they, it's, it's, an, it's a subconscious pattern, it's a pattern that's playing out. So go back. What is this? What do I gain from being the sick one? Oof. Let that land. What do I gain? Oh, I gain sympathy. I, I have a, a back door for why I never go for my goals. Uh, I don't have to actually uh, go deep in relationships because I'm sick. Remember, I'm the sick one. I'm the hurt one. Now, I know I'm going really deep here, and some of, this may true, babe, some of this may be true, and maybe none of it's true. But I'm just giving you a window into how I peek around, I poke around and stuff. I look at the language I'm saying. When? When do I not feel the pain as much? When does the pain come back even more? Who am I hanging around? What am I drinking? What am I eating? What am I consuming? 
We become scientists, happy scientists of ourselves, mad and sad and all the things scientists. That, that's the portal, that's the window, that's the opening. Okay, this person said, do you have any advice on being in a relationship with someone in recovery? My partner is in recovery and I wanna be supportive in all that entails but I'm also balancing pr protecting my peace. Yes, ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, we choose partners. Your soul chose this person. And when you chose them, you chose this too. You chose recovery, you chose addiction, you chose all of it, because it's a part of it. What I would do is the idea Sometimes when somebody's addicted or something like that, they have something so easy to look at, right? There's innies versus outies and your partner has an outie, right? Which is recovery, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is. The idea that most people come up with is, oh, I, I, I'm in a relationship with a crazy person or, or they're the messed up one. But I want to remind you that birds of a feather flock together. I want to remind you that we don't attract what we want, but what we are. In consciousness and so uh, they may be dealing with recovery over here but I promise you you're dealing with something over here and so a part of it is not judging your partner from the space of you're better because you're not you're just in a different place than them you're dealing with your trauma and toxic shame in a different way all of us have strategies to stay safe and sometimes those strategies are deeply destructive and easy to point out. And some of them are deeply destructive and harder to point out. Oof. Is anybody picking up what I'm putting down? Some of you, I know people right now who are experiencing deep levels of crazy shame, but you would not be able to find it and see it because they're, they're not as easily identifiable. If you live long enough and you do this kind of work, you know that everybody is going through something. So yes, protect your peace, but not against your partner, not because they're in recovery, protect it because that's the most loving thing you get to do for you. Because when you take care of you, when your cup is full, then you have an overflow to give. When you give from an empty cup, when you give from deficit, when you give from people pleasing, when you give from a place of lack, the only thing that can return is more lack. And then after that, resentment towards the person who you gave from. Fill your cup, give from the overflow. Fill your cup, give from the overflow. That's the answer. This person said, uh, I might be off topic, but I grew up in the foster care. And so now I'm going through adult, uh, adulthood alone and carrying a lot of trauma. Any tips? It's been difficult. Yes, um, everybody's carrying a lot of trauma. And yes, foster children and the, the abandonment and all the stuff, all the wounds that come from not having a, a, a family that, a blood family that chose you or somebody dropped the ball, somebody didn't care enough, right? Which is what your mind may be thinking. One of the biggest tips is don't do it alone. Let other people hold you and help you. Get support, get professional support, get friend support, but continue to, to check in with how am I, because a lot of times when, when somebody experiences uh, really big traumatic abandonments, um, the rest of their lives they can find themselves in hypervigilance and bracing for the next abandonment. Meaning you may start dating someone and it's beautiful and the honeymoon and all that stuff and as soon as your heart is all the way in, you start bracing. Oh my God, he's going to leave me. He's going to leave me. He's going to cheat. He's going to leave. He's going to cheat. He's going to leave. He's going to cheat. And you begin to brace and sabotage and put that energy. You poison the well. You poison the well that both of you are drinking from because of the childhood wounds. And so your work is to take that energy and hand it to someone else. Take that energy, not your partner. They can't be them. You take it to a friend. You take it to a therapist. You take, take it to a coach and you, you take it to a workshop. You say, here, hold this with me. And then you feel it. You feel it. You allow it. You feel it. You feel it. You allow it. You feel it. And then you clear the channel. I have, I've experienced lots of trauma in this lifetime. Deep levels of shame in this lifetime. 
And right now I experience deep levels of liberation and freedom. And a huge part of that is because I did and have done exactly what I just said. So those are some of the tips. Family has been terribly stubborn. Their final financial source is to sell their house. I want to help them have been resistant for decades. Every day is critical. What is the best way to show up? That message is a little cryptic, but I'll just say, um, don't get too attached to the house, my man. It's just material. If you're gonna get attached to anything, get attached to helping their nervous systems regulate by loving on them and accepting them right where they are. Because a lot of time the resistance and stubbornness that happens in families is because everybody thinks they're right. The, the work is to put down the sword of righteousness, put that sword back and say, let me open right now. Right? I don't know. I don't know enough to know what's, what's, what's needing to happen. So let me just love and open. Let me just accept and, and pour into my mom, dad, brother, sister, cousin. Let me stop judging them. Even if you don't say it out loud, people can feel energetically when they are being judged and not accepted. And so your work, my friend, is to not get too attached or caught up in the idea of the house and holding and keeping the house. Keep the relationship over the house. Keep the love in your heart over the idea of the house. That's where the power is. And then watch. They'll probably come right back to you. This person said, how do I balance um, going for my goals and loving my children? I think that most people get in trouble when it comes to goals and children because they think that they're separate. They think and want because they're so used to setting their lives up where, where I go after my goals and I have all the time in the world and there's no interruptions and I, I can sit and ponder and think and et cetera, et cetera. Well, you also chose to have a lot of sex and have a child. And when those two things are put together, you actually put them together. The most agile creatures on the planet don't lock in to one way that it needs to be. An example would be a leopard. A leopard can kill you from jumping out of a tree, but they can also kill you from ambushing you and running up on you and chasing you down. They aren't locked in to the idea of tree. There's a million ways that that leopard can come towards you. And that's the same way you need to look at your goals and your children. It's all connected. It's all interwoven. If you take away the timeline, oh, I got to get here by X. I got to get here by Y. And you just say, hey, how can I enjoy this process and enjoy my children? How can I bring them um, together? Right? This person asked when to just honor divine timing versus when to push versus when to relax. And the short answer to that is when it's necessary. There are seasons even in a day, let alone in a week, let alone in a month, let alone in a year. If you're in a season where you feel, and all of us have had that moment where you feel energy, you feel the surge, you feel the part of you that wants to drive towards the goal. When that's there, you go for it. For example, I have the most energy in the mornings. So that, if, if, if the whole day was a season, in the morning, that is my summer. I am in my body. I am ready to go. I am charging in the mornings. By the time we get to midday, I'm in, you know, autumn. I'm in fall, right? The leaves start to fall. The, the energy starts to dissipate. Two more hours after that, I'm in winter. And I take my time. Now, here's the thing. You can segment that, all of this into one day or you can segment it into weeks. So, for instance, when I used to be a theater nerd, there were performance days. Days where we were going to do acting. We were going to be on the stage. We were going to be doing Shakespeare. And on those days, I did not do all the other things. And then after the show, I had rest days. Right? Where all I was going to do is rest and recover, rest and recover. Segment your life in that way. Find your personal rhythm and the rest of it will make sense. And the rest of it will work itself out. Blessings and blessings to all of you. I appreciate every single one of you.